Hello, everyone. Welcome to the sixth conversation in the Summer Speaker Series brought to you by the AEI Academic Programs Department. The Summer Speaker Series is a chance for members of our student network to stay connected with each other and to take a deeper dive into some of the latest scholarship coming out of AEI during the summer months. My name is Gil Guerra. I'm an Academic Programs Assistant here at AEI. And today I'm very excited to be speaking with Professor Michael Beckley on challenges to China's rise. Before getting started, I want to remind you all that we'll be hosting these conversations on Wednesdays, usually around 5.30 p.m. Eastern time throughout July. So keep an eye on your inbox for future invitations and be sure to like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at AEI for students to check out our full July lineup. The last thing I'll mention is that if you attend three or more of our summer speaker series webinars, you'll be automatically entered to a t-shirt giveaway. You can find that design on our social media. I don't want to hype it up too much. It has been described as the must-have fashion statement of summer 2020 by a Facebook commentator. So very authoritative source there. Our format today is pretty straightforward. Professor Beckley and I will have a conversation for around 20 minutes, and then I'll turn to your questions. So if you have any questions for Professor Beckley throughout the webinar, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible in the last 10 minutes of our session. With that said, I'm excited to introduce Michael Beckley, who is a Jean Kirkpatrick Visiting Scholar here at AI. Professor Beckley, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Gil. It's really good to be here. And thank you all for tuning in. Yeah, great. I'd like to start out with a more conceptual question. There seems to be a narrative in both domestic and international media that the United States is declining as a superpower and that China is almost destined to overtake it. What do you think is behind this common assumption and do you agree with it? Um, I mean, there's certainly some truth behind that. So, you know, if you just look in the military realm, China can do things that it couldn't do 20 years ago. So now China has these very advanced missiles that can strike U.S. bases throughout Northeast Asia. It can potentially even target American aircraft carriers. That's something new that the United States hasn't had to deal with. Um, China obviously has been throwing big bags of money all over Eurasia with its Belt and Road Initiative. So that, of course, is a very ambitious move. Um, in technology, you know, China has been investing massive amounts of money into research and development, especially in cutting edge areas like artificial intelligence. So China's overall R&D budget is almost uh, the same as, as the United States is at this point. So it's really closed the gap. And then I think most um, most challenging um, in, in the near term is that China seems to be basically perfecting dictatorship in the sense that it's using digital technologies in ways that give it give the Communist Party control over its population in ways that Mao Zedong couldn't have even imagined. You know, so for all these reasons, China has been making big um, steps forward in terms of the goals for the Chinese Communist Party. So it's totally understandable why people would view China as this rising juggernaut. I do think though, when China's rise does get exaggerated, that's a big part of my, my research. And there's a few reasons why. I think one is uh, the metrics that we usually use to size up countries. The ones that are just easy to print in like a newspaper headline or things like you know GDP, uh, defense spending, R&D spending. And what a lot of my research has shown is that those kind of gross metrics systematically overstate or exaggerate the, the power resources of countries that have big populations. Because even though these countries, they have a lot of resources, they have a big economy, they also have a lot of costs because they have to take care of, you know, in China's case, 1.3 billion people. But a lot of our metrics only look at like the asset side of the ledger and we, don't, we pay less attention to the fact that China leads the world in most like problems, you know, like debt, pollution, et cetera. So when you factor those in, you know, you, it becomes clear that China's rise still has a number of challenges ahead of it. I think another reason um, China's rise tends to get exaggerated is it does serve a lot of interests. Uh, it's very useful if, you, if you're in fundraising to have a 10 foot tall adversary. So whether you're in the Defense Department and you want to, you know, raise budgets, it's a lot easier to do so if, you know, China looks like this rising peer competitor. Um, if you're a company and you want the government to give you subsidies or give you certain um, tax breaks, you say, well, look, we, in order to compete against the rising Chinese juggernaut, we need these kind of tax breaks. Um, media, you know, it's if you want to sell copy, writing about the uh, dynamic rise of a emerging superpower is a lot more interesting than, um, you know, sort of middle road option. Um, so for all these reasons, I think, you know, China, the rise of China has gotten tons and tons of press. Some of it is, is warranted, but I do think it tends to get ex exaggerated for a number of reasons. Great. 
And you mentioned that oftentimes those gross measures uh, tend to perhaps overstate China's strength or at least mask some of its weaknesses. Uh, some of these include economic measures such as investment rates, growth rates especially. So can you talk about maybe some economic trends that should cause China's leaders some concern? What I think first, um, if you just look at sort of the wealth balance, um, you know, China's economy is really big, but it's very inefficient. So even though it produces a lot of activity and a lot of output, it does so at enormous expense. So Chinese businesses on average have to burn twice the amount of capital and use five times the labor of the average US company to produce the same amount of output. So you're just burning a lot more inputs. Um, more than a third of China's uh, industrial capacity is sitting idle because it's just not, it's, it's not needed. It's just excess capacity. Um, you know, half of China's R&D spending is, is stolen. Um, so, you know, for all these reasons, there's just a lack of efficiency in China's economy that drags down the amount of wealth that it can generate. And at the end of the day, China still is um, in large part a developing country. I mean, people, I think unless you've lived in China, you don't realize that, you know, almost half the population is still uh, considered is rural, essentially. And 30 percent of people as workforce are still basically small farmers, like peasants. Um, and are, are just growing food sort of at a subsistence agriculture level. So there's this big um, sort of a big part of its population is just tied down and trying to essentially feed itself. And when you look ahead, um, I've, I've argued in, in, in my book in a number of articles that China actually faces a number of headwinds sort of on the, the horizon because a lot of the advantages that sort of propelled China's rise over the last 30 years are actually going to become liabilities. So like in the 1990s and early 2000s, you know, China enjoyed sort of expanding market access to all kinds of countries as people tried to bring it into the WTO. China had plenty of food and water and energy resources. And I think most important, China had the greatest demographic dividend in human history. So because of the one child policy and, and China's population history, it had eight, eight workers for every retiree in its population. Whereas like the US today has three workers per retiree. So just a super, you know, it's primed for productivity essentially. The problem is all of those things are starting to go away and will go away over the next 20 to 30 years. So China is gonna suffer the worst aging crisis of any of the great powers um, over the next 30 years. It's already decimated its natural resources and is running out of just basic things like water and arable land. It's super dependent now on foreign energy resources. And it's also racked up. Its debt has quintupled in absolute terms just over the last 10 years. So there's all of these um, headwinds that are going to make growth much harder for China over the next 20 to 30 years than it has been over the last 20 to 30 years. Great. And on that economic front, there's often a lot made about how economically intertwined China and the United States are to the degree that it's often a talking point uh, in the media and among different policy experts that we might be too intertwined to really be able to risk a major political, economic, even military confrontation with China. So what degree is that statement true and what level of interdependency should we strive for? So, I mean, we are interdependent to a significant extent. I don't know if it rises to the level, though, that it would be a major constraint in a serious like security sort of crisis. Um, and, and frankly, I think there's going to be a fair amount of decoupling over the next 10 years. Um, we certainly trade and invest a lot with China. But I think what's crucial to understand is there's a big difference between just if you trade with someone versus are you actually dependent on that other country. So, you know, we import a lot of, you know, like shoes or assembled computer devices, um, um, even things like medicines and rare earths. If the United States really needed to, it could source those things elsewhere. There would be, of course, major adjustment costs in the short term, but I think in, in a lot of cases, those aren't nearly high enough to be major strategic constraints over the long term. In the short term, it's gonna, you're gonna take a big hit, but I think in the long term, it's certainly doable to have some decoupling in, in across those types of industries. Mm -hmm. I would argue the same is, the same is, not, is not true of, of China because China depends on things that it, it would be very hard pressed to get elsewhere if it had to look outside of not just the United States, but the US alliance network. So, you know, China, if everyone knows China depends very much on imports of things like high-end semiconductors, um, computer numerical control machines from the United States and its allies. And, you know, the United States is exploiting that vulnerability to basically crush 
Chinese firms right now. China, of course, wants to end its technological dependence and is pumping lots of money in. But I think actually the case of semiconductors is is instructive because um, you know China's been pumping billions of dollars into its national champion, um, the Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation. And even today, that company still relies on subsidies for about 40% of its revenue versus about 3% for most US firms. And its chips still lag behind foreign competitors by about half a decade, which is actually a lot in the, mm -hmm. the battle for sort of tech supremacy. Um, and so, you know, the United States and China certainly are severely intertwined. Decoupling would be extremely difficult to do. But I think what you can do is have limited decoupling where you basically, and I think this is basically going on where like U.S. policymakers are making a, like a white list of lots of basic consumer products that it would be okay for the United States to rely on China on, and that kind of business can, can continue, but then trying to isolate those key strategic technologies that have either military applications or are critical for, you know, widespread spillovers across high technology. And I think you're going to see a lot of decoupling um, in, in that area over the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Great. And before we move on, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about China's demography. You mentioned that there are some demographic trends that are currently not working in their favor. However, uh, oftentimes, if you raise these points, someone who might be a little bit more optimistic about China's strength, uh, let's say, would say something along the lines of, well, China is a dictatorship. They can very easily control their demographics in a way that a liberal democracy like the United States can't. So they can just institute measures to try to fix their demographic trends. And in the long term, those might not be an issue. Can you talk about why it won't be so simple for them to fix some of the problems in their demographic trends? Well, I think the hardest thing is it takes, you know, 18 years and nine months to make, you know, an adult worker. So even if China, you know, forced its population to start breeding right now, which I don't even know how they would do, uh, it's not going to solve the problem over the next, you know, couple of decades. So I, I really think this, there's two demographic trends that I think are basically baked into the cake. And even a powerful authoritarian government like China really can't do anything about it. So, I mean, China is literally going to lose more than 200 million people of working age just over the next 30 years. And it's going to gain more than 300 million people over the age of 65. And so mm. and there's just no way you, I mean, it's impossible that that's baked into the cake. That's going to happen. And most estimates suggest that China's age related spending. So like the healthcare, the, the pensions, all the things that are going to have to pay for this aging population is going to triple from where it's at by the middle of the century. Um, and because China, it's social safety net is horribly, underfunded. So I think that, I mean, that alone is going to cause severe problems for China's rise. Uh, and then the second, the second issue that China really can't do anything about is the fact that it's, it is, it has, and is going to have 40 million extra young men, um, more than women. And so these men have basically no prospect of, of finding a bride. Having been, you know, a young single male at one point in my life, I can tell you, we tend to do really stupid things. My wife would tell you, you know, we do really dumb things until we sort of uh, settle down. So that, that itself is also a major cause of potential domestic um, unrest. And, you know, there's very little China can do about it over the next 20 years. Great. In your book, Unrivaled, Why America Will Remain the World's Sole Superpower, you discuss how assessments of military strength tend to focus on measures such as spending and personnel, but often ignore key factors such as liabilities. Uh, can you explain why accounting for liabilities is important, as well as some of the fundamental differences, perhaps, between the Chinese military and the U.S. military? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, the again, the problem is sort of we use very simple metrics that obscure a lot of the critical differences. So, like, you could have two countries that, on paper, have the exact same military, like in terms of number of ships and troops and, and tanks, but they could have vastly different levels of military power if one of them has you know, superior technology and better recruits and better retra uh, training, has more combat experience. And even if all of those qualitative factors were the same, you could still have major differences if one of those two countries um, is in a really rough neighborhood and surrounded by enemies and has a lot of domestic instability, whereas the other is you know, stable and surrounded by say two oceans and, and two allies. So what, what I've done in, in my research is to try to take those kind of factors um, into account. And you know, I found that they actually make a major difference in the kind of military power that each country, the United States and China could bring to the board. So you know, just simple things like on average, 
China's weapon systems are roughly half as capable as those of their, their sort of American direct counterparts in terms of things like range and firepower and accuracy. Um, China's military personnel, its troops and pilots and sailors, don't have any combat experience and they receive less than half the training of their American counterparts. And I think most importantly, um, you know, China's in a really rough neighborhood. And so border defense and internal security drain about 35% of China's military budget and bog down half of its active duty force. Whereas the US military enjoys, you know, a secure home base and can focus, basically project its capabilities um, abroad. So simply by the fact that China has to keep so much of its military on guard at home actually saps a big chunk of its overall military power. So just looking at those kind of liabilities kind of helps put China's military rise in, in perspective. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think any conversation about China's current geopolitical strength would be incomplete if we didn't discuss the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. How do you think that COVID-19 has impacted China's hard power and its soft power? And what do you think China's management of the crisis tells us about the sort of superpower that it would be? Yeah, I mean, I think some some of the the costs to China are are really are not like necessarily unique to China. So like every you know every great power, well, not necessarily every great power, but let's say the United States and China both uh, are taking a major economic hit. Um, and both countries have taken a big hit in terms of their soft power. I mean, I think they both, for different reasons, look pretty terrible coming mm -hmm. out of the crisis. So they're both sort of diminished. I would say, and, but then each of these countries has sort of unique things that are uniquely bad for its, its situation. I think in, in China's case is that there is a, there's sort of a backlash to China, a diplomatic backlash, especially within the region. So um, you take something like Taiwan, for example. Uh, if you look at Taiwanese opinion polls, you know, it's not like people were pro-China to begin with, but they become virulently anti-China and become even more determined to not have, not mm -hmm. be sort of folded back into China because they see that the regime, um, you know, with, with the cover up and the fact that its response and, and, and the numbers on its response to the COVID crisis have been um, so bad compared to Taiwan's, that gives them more faith in their own democratic system and less faith in China's system. So it sort of reinforced Taiwan's determination to remain independent. And then just around the region, um, you know, China's worn out a lot of good faith. The second sort of big negative thing for China coming out of it is I think the crisis has heightened calls to decouple um, especially the U.S. economy from the Chinese economy, but, but it goes across all the major powers where there's this fear now of, you know, I think it's heightened fear of, first of all, things that can cross borders like disease, but second of all, just having any kind of major dependence on China for critical things like medicines or other consumer products, masks, etc. And so it's, it's heightening this this push to decouple economies for the developed economies to reshore more of their industries or at least move them somewhere else like into Southeast Asia. And because China still depends for a big part of its GDP on you know, integration with the global economy, exports and being able to import raw materials, I think that also is a big negative um, for China coming out of the crisis. The United States has its own you know, set of terrible things that are happening in the wake of this, but at least for China, those would be the main things. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll turn it over to the audience for questions in just a second. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in using the Q&A function. But I do want to ask one final question, and that is what we should consider a successful relationship with China to look like. Should we consider success simply as maintaining our current balance of power? Um, if so, what is the best way to ensure that outcome? And if not, what should our concept of success be when it comes to our relations with China? I think that's an incredibly tough question. I think maybe if you'd asked me that question five years ago, I, I might've had a more optimistic view about ways the United States and China could uh, find ways to work together. Um, you could say, hey, let's focus on these transnational problems and we both have interests in things like climate change or reducing nuclear proliferation and maybe that can transcend parts of the rivalry. There might've been some crisis stability things we could do, you know, working out codes of conduct. But I, I honestly feel like in this political climate, a lot of that ship has kind of sailed. And so I've become in incredibly pessimistic about the future of US-China relations. I actually can't think of a good way to really eliminate the root cause of US-China rivalry. I think it's basically inevitable for at least mm -hmm. the next decade. And is that actually probably gonna get worse 
given that both countries are going to face economic headwinds, which is going to make them more prickly and more uh, uh, economically nationalist and probably um, less willing to back down in crises because they feel the pride is online. We've seen this happen with great power mm -hmm. throughout history. So what I would say at this point is the United States just needs to find ways to protect its interests with China while trying to do what it can to avoid a slide into an all out cold war or even a, a hot war. And I think there's some basic stuff we can do like um, in terms of military deterrence. Right now we put a lot of our eggs in the same basket with these big bases and our aircraft carriers. And that has really negative repercussions for crisis stability because so much of our military hardware is concentrated. There's new defense concepts that talk about spreading out our forces so they can't be hit in a first strike and can also credibly deny China the ability to sort of overrun the region. Um, I think in terms, we need to build up our alliances, which have been atrophying um, for the last few years. There's talk of, you know, not just military alliances, but sort of ideological alliances. There's talk of sort of forming like a, a D10, a group of really strong, powerful democracies to stand up to China in terms of its attempts to spread digital authoritarianism around the world. And then I think a lot of the stuff we need to do is domestic investment, you know, so uh, domestic research and development, um, maintaining high skill immigration, um, whether that's through the H-1B process or actually just increasing the cap for high skill immigrants, maybe even trying to reform our immigration policy. So a lot of it is sort of nation building um, at home. These are all pretty standard um, precautions and I don't think they're gonna really solve the problem between the United States and China, but I think they just help the United States compete better and hopefully at least keep the lid on conflict um, enough so that you know, we don't have some whole crisis with China. Great. Our first audience question comes from Milan Chandi, who asks, considering Xi Jinping has successfully eliminated term limits for the CCP, and he has revolutionized Chinese policy in the past few years, do you believe that he will attempt to hold on to power in a similar way to Vladimir Putin or even Mao? Yeah, I mean, I think he basically already has. I mean, I think what he did at the, the um, last party Congress was, you know, he's basically written himself into China's history. And the only way he's going to be removed from power is essentially through violent or tumultuous means. I think he's fully determined um, to hang on to power. He's purged more of his rivals than any Chinese leader since, since Mao. I do think people underestimate how much resentment there is because he's crushed a lot of very powerful families along the way. So I'm not saying that that kind of scenario is out of the question, but in terms of his determination, he clearly wants to rule for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Great. Our next question comes from Michael Sauer, who asks, what do you make of China's efforts to remove itself from the U.S. dollar financial system by advocating for blockchain and debuting a new digital currency? Could China strike success over the long term and how should the U.S. respond? Uh, yeah, that's a fantastic question. I think there was a, if, if you want to read more on this, Hank Paulson actually wrote a great piece in, in foreign affairs that I, I basically agree with, where I think it makes total sense for China to pursue things like blockchain and trying to find some kind of alternative to the dollar. But we've seen uh, in the wake of, of uh, crisis after crisis, so the 2008 financial crisis and now the COVID crisis, that people flee to dollars in times of insecurity. Um, and it's sort of the, the currency of last resort. And so I think the, China has its work cut out there if it actually does want to displace the dollar. I'm also not so sure that China really wants to do that because that would of course require the Chinese regime to loosen a lot of its capital controls and let the renminbi um, you know, float on international markets. And that would reduce a lot of the autonomy that China has to regulate the economy, to manipulate its currency, and to frankly prevent massive capital flight, like we saw in 2015, where China kind of experimented with some of these things, and you know, uh, you know, a trillion dollars started flowing out of the Chinese economy. So I think China, the Chinese government, is extremely worried about capital flight, and therefore maintains these capital controls, and therefore, you know, challenging the dollar while it would be nice um, is sort of a second order issue for me. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from Noah, who asks, what does U.S. withdrawal from the WHO mean for China's standing within typically Western-led international organizations? Is it within U.S. strategic interest to prevent Chinese capture of international organizations? 
Yeah, so here, here's an area where I'm torn because obviously I wouldn't want the United States to pull out of the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I believe in international institutions like the WHO. At the same time, I think there's no denying that China has had an incredibly corrupting influence on a lot of, especially the UN um, institutions and including the WHO. Um, you know, I think it's, it's clear they, they, they got their favored um, person in charge of the WHO and the WHO sort of bent over backwards to um, you know, put on a good face for, for China. And I think that's really problematic. So this is an area where I'm torn, where I don't think the right solution is for the United States to pull out, but I also get what the Trump administration is doing in the sense of trying to really turn the screw on these international organizations so that China can't simply take them over. I think the better solution would be to basically take a page out of China's playbook where they've seeded, um, they've seeded uh, uh, personnel throughout UN agencies and they, they tow a consistent line, you know, putting China's <laughs> interests at the forefront. I think the United States would need to do something uh, similar in order to counter China's um, pernicious influence in those organizations, but just pulling out basically seeds that territory to China without a fight. Great. And on this question of international organizations and uh, how they basically impact uh, China's behavior on the international stage, we have a question from Deanna Schmidt who asks, what do you make of China's recent human rights violations in regards to the Uyghur population in the West, i.e. forced abortions and sterilizations, settlement population growth? Is this something that you foresee causing further strains or having more far-reaching implications between China and the United States? I mean, I, it sounds like, you know, genocide, essentially, right? So um, what, what is happening in Xinjiang, I think we're eventually going to find out more, and it's going to be even worse than many of us imagine um, at, at this point. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that has, even though I, I, I have my doubts about how much this particular administration really cares about human rights, because this issue dovetails with the desire to get tough with China, I think it's going to be a salient issue. We've actually seen the administration, um, you know, put it front and center. So I think the more that comes out um, and, and stories are, are leaking out um, um, quite rapidly at this point, it's going to be a major issue. And it's not so much that the United States has love for the Uyghurs, but mm -hmm. this, this, this sounds like one of the worst cases of, you know, population control and maybe even a move towards ethnic cleansing that we've seen um, in the post-1945 period. So this would put, I think, the U.S., it would basically infuse the U.S.-China competition with that much more of an ideological schism um, where, you know, if the United States is smart, it can position itself as sort of a defender of human rights and try to garner um, some credibility that way and to put China on the defensive and I don't know what the United States can do other than what it's done in terms of sanctioning Chinese officials that are affiliated with what's going on in Xinjiang, but at least by naming and shaming China, it can start to impose costs on it for what seem to be absolutely horrific actions. Great. And our next question comes from Amy White, who says, in Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations, Huntington argues that the West influence on other civilizations is decreasing in part because Asian and Islamic civilizations are becoming less attracted to Western values. To what degree might we expect this increased rejection of the currently dominant Western and specifically American culture to possibly play into China's rise? Yeah, I actually am really worried about sort of the disillusion of, of the West, as it were. I think part of it is that, you know, what we think of as like the free world, that people were united there. It started during the Cold War, essentially, and when the Soviet Union dissolved, that kind of took out one of the major sort of raison d'etre of, of having this sort of liberal democratic capitalist alliance. And then since then, the liberal democratic world is going to be hit by major structural crises over the next 30 to 40 years. So demographically, it's going to be absolutely devastating. I think the average liberal democracy, its working age population is going to contract by 16% senior populations are going to rise by 50% or more. That means, uh, you know, spending on taking care of these aging populations is going to skyrocket. And I don't know how liberal democracies are going to pay for it because on average, they carry over 200% of debt on their GDP. So um, it's going to be a really tight fiscal condition. And I just worry, we've seen it throughout history, when economic times get hard, people tend to become more economically nationalist. And so something like the EU, uh, the WTO, all these institutions and this sort of 
a common thread of a, a liberal democratic capitalist world. I can see countries, you know, things starting to come apart. And then, frankly, the United States may be sort of leading the way <laughs> through a lot of this because the United States not only will be experiencing a lot of those same problems, but the United States could very well just say, well, we have this giant continental economy here in North America. We're going to focus there, care a lot less about, you know, defending allies abroad. So I just worry that the, what Huntington talked about as sort of Western civilization is going to start fracturing from within. I don't necessarily know that like the Chinese civilization or the Islamic civilization is going to be any less divided, especially given that China's aging crisis is going to be way worse. Um, it's going to have a lot of problems with automation, given that so much of its pop it, it relies on mass low skill employment for social stability. But that doesn't necessarily mean things are going well in sort of Western civilization. I actually worry about the re-rise of economic nationalism, and that may even spill over into sort of security-related nationalism as well. Great. Well, that's all the time that we have for today's conversation. Professor, thank you very much. On that happy note. <laughs> yes, on that happy note. And if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, want to essentially continue more uh, reading on this theme, highly recommend getting a copy of Unrivaled, uh, which is a great summer read, if I do say so myself. Uh, thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. We hope you can join us again next Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll be speaking with AI's Adam White on partisanship and the Supreme Court. So keep an eye out for that invitation tomorrow and check out our full July lineup on Facebook or Instagram, again, at AI for Students. And lastly, if you have undergraduate friends who are interested in these types of conversations, invite them to sign up for our student network to receive invitations to the Summer Speaker Series and learn more about different opportunities that AI has for students. Thank you all again for joining and we will see you all next week.